Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Bird, and I'm going to be talking today about kernel coding the upstream way. So uh, it's my presentation. I'm a principal software engineer at Sony Electronics, and uh, I included the abstract in the slides. That's just for people who uh, view these slides afterwards so they can kind of get an overview of the talk. What I'm going to be talking today about is uh, basically coding idioms. That second bullet is the most important thing. But I'm going to start with a little bit uh, of an explanation about kernel development priorities. And then um, at the end, I'm going to go over some conclusions and uh, give you some pointers to some resources. So uh, let's talk first about kernel development priorities. So it's very, very important. Linux is used in a lot of places. Uh, it's a, super important that it's correct. Uh, that's kind of obvious. Uh, that consists of do things work properly, and also security. I would fall. I would say falls under correctness. Does it? Uh, is it resistant to attacks and that type of thing? Then after that, the next priority is performance. Uh, of course, the kernel developers want things to be as uh, fast and as small as possible. And, and the kernel developers want as much resources of the, the compute environment available for user space. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, priority, and it's a very big priority, is maintainability. Can things be maintained? Uh, does it require superhuman effort or can mere mortals come and uh, maintain the kernel? So if you look at these in upstream priorities, they're really kind of uh, interrelated. So um, maintainable code has less bugs over time and therefore leads to correctness. So you could make the argument that maintainability is actually more important. It's kind of like rock, paper, scissors, where correctness is more important than performance. Uh, performance is more important than maintainability. But if you don't have maintainability, you're going to lose that correctness. And so that's also very important. And the reason I bring those up is I think it uh, it provides the rationale for a lot of these coding idioms that I'm going to be talking about. So. So what are the coding idioms? Um, I've divided the things I want to talk about into kind of these four main categories, error handling, structures and pointers, uh, things having to do with code efficiency, and then maintainability. So let's just dive right in. So let's start with null pointers. So when you're writing code for Linux kernel, you should check your pointers for null on return from allocation. So Hopefully, uh, that's kind of a first level uh, computer science or programming uh, idiom. Uh, but there are some uh, kind of nuances in the kernel a little bit different. So first, uh, you should check in the subroutines immediately after allocation. But uh, you don't need to check for null if you can validate that null is not possible on the code path. So if you're calling a routine that itself is allocating the pointer and doing a null check, uh, you don't need to to check that null uh, because we don't want extraneous uh, checks all over the place. However, uh, when you're doing this, you do need to be mindful that code changes over time. And so uh, if you look at where you're getting your pointers from and you see that refactoring could easily introduce a code path where the null is not checked, uh, then uh, you, you can go ahead and add a check. Another thing about uh, null pointers is you'll see this a lot in the kernel. People will have a macro called bug on which emits a bug if a pointer is null. Uh, that's actually uh, kind of discouraged. Uh, the hardware will catch bugs on null pointer dereferences. Uh, the kernel has uh, down at address zero, it's got a page of zeros, and uh, there's fault mechanisms for all the architectures to handle that. So you really don't need to put explicit uh, bug-ons in your code. Uh, an error that you might see in oops from the kernel or panic would be bug unable to handle kernel null pointer dereference at you know some address. I'm sure you've all seen that. Uh, and that's a null pointer dereference. That was someplace that uh, uh, the null pointer was not caught. The other thing about null pointers is uh, freeing null pointers is, is just fine. In fact, it's encouraged to just go ahead and free the pointer without doing an if on it first. So don't do if pointer k free. Uh, just k free the pointer. The kernel allocation uh, mechanisms and the free mechanisms, uh, they know how to deal with null. And so you don't need to use the extra cycles to check before you call. Uh, there's a lot of semantic checkers that will go through and, and find null dereferences. Uh, so those are very useful to run. Uh, Cosinel has, has some. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that's that's good stuff on null pointers. Just a couple more notes about null pointers. So null is not the same thing as zero, and zero is not the same thing as null. Well, they have the same value. Internally, it's, it's a 
a word value that's all zero, but they have different types. And uh, just to keep people's mental model correct, don't don't do things like assigning a pointer zero. Uh, if you want a null pointer, assign it null. Um, and it is it is vastly preferred to check for null with if not pointer rather than checking against a specific value if pointer equals equals null. Um, so if you look at the stats in the Linux kernel, I did a quick uh, look at uh, the Linux kernel to see how people were checking for null after kmalloc, uh, which is one of the main routines used to allocate memory. So you see 766 are using if pointer equals equals null, which is the kind of the discouraged form. Uh, 5,000 uh, if not pointer. And then interestingly, uh, about 1,000 where the null check was not within the next four lines. So I'm sure there's null checks in there somewhere. But just make sure you check your nulls. Um, next idiom is go to's. Now, normally go to statements are considered bad. We've all been taught in our computer science and programming that uh, you can create bad spaghetti code. But the kernel uses go to's in a very specific way for error unwinding. So the structure of the code when using go to's in the kernel is you allocate resources, you perform operations, uh, then you return success. Uh, if there's some errors, uh, then you deallocate the re resources in reverse order uh, using l labels, and then you return uh, failure. So let's take a look at what this looks like in a very generic thing. You have some function uh, that does do A, <clears throat> and if there's an error, you go to out undo A, you do B. If there's an error, go out, undo B. Uh, and then the return success, um, and then the opposite order with the go to label. So let's look at an actual example from the kernel. If you see, um, this is from XFS Open Devices, and you don't need to read all the other code. Um, but just looking at the structure of the go to's, you see how they're nested. And then the return path, uh, they're nested in a reverse order with labels that uh, clearly identify kind of what's going on out close rt dev out close log dev and then just out um, and just a couple of more things i want to say about this here's here's the code kind of expanded out more um, you'll see that the success routine on the left there has uh, a lot of well that's all the code that does the allocation and, and that's the first part of the routine the second part of the routine is all the error handling so you've got this separation between uh, the flow of, of control when the code is operating correctly or when there's no errors and different things. The other thing about this example is that uh, you'll see the error, errors uh, are actually allocated, pre-allocated ahead of time. Well, these errors, that's how things are getting detected, but it's going into a variable that's going to be used in the final return. Um, and so just a couple of notes on the use of go-tos. So it's useful to set up your error or whatever variable you're using, error or ret, ahead of time. Um, notice that the success return is in the middle of the routine. So as you're looking at kernel source, it's very common uh, to see the, re the success return instead of at the end of the routine, to see it in the middle of the routine. Uh, the error handling, this what, what this does is it puts the error handling code out of the main flow. So error paths, uh, which should be unlikely code, are out of the main function cache footprint. Um, and the success case, in the case where you have success, uh, you have less jumps or possibly shorter jumps. Um, now, the uh, one good kind of tip is to use an out underscore prefix on your go-to labels. Uh, people also use other things like error underscore or uh, there's no end of uh, weird things. But using the out prefix is kind of more common. Uh, now, having said that, the preference is to use out underscore. That's what most of the kernel uses. But follow the style for your subsystem. Uh, so, and then the the other thing about go-to labels is try to have the rest of the label be descriptive of whatever undo your op operation you're doing. So, uh, underscore free, underscore release, underscore unlock. Um, and then, in terms of resources uh, for go-tos, here's here's just uh, looking at some of the labels that are popular in the kernel. You notice that the most common <laughs> go-to label in the kernel is out with about 15,000 uh, instances. Uh, but error colon is also a pretty popular one. Uh, my personal preference is to avoid error and error out. Uh, seems like out is winning the battle here. Uh, so that's just uh, when you're making up your labels, you know, use, use something sensible.
Now, moving on to return values. So uh, just like in uh, the Unix uh, programming model in user space, return values in the kernel use success. Uh, they use return zero to indicate success. On failure, uh, you will return a negative error number. Um, and that negative is important. Uh, so the exception for this rule is that uh, things that are functions that have a name that's a predicate, like for instance, PCI uh, dev present, if it's returning something that's obvious from the name of it that it's a true false, you should return zero for false and one for true. Otherwise your if statements read weird. Um, so, and then for functions that return a pointer, you should return one of three values. You should return either valid pointer, null, or error pointer uh, with the error no. And that's a case you need to sneak some more information into the return value. So the caller can check uh, that value to see if, uh, see if there's an error with a macro called is error. And then they can convert it back uh, using error, pointer error. So here's, um, uh, what's the rationale for, for doing things this way? Well, return codes have a limited uh, value range, right? They're limited to a single integer or pointer. Basically one word is what you can get back. Uh, so you have to overload things again. You have to put the error uh, namespace, if you will, into the same uh, space as the return value space. Uh, but we have strong conventions here that helps keep everyone sane. Um, the error numbers, if uh, if you need to look them up, they're uh, over in include UAPI ASM generic errorno.h. Uh, and make sure you use the right one for your subsystem and whatever the condition is that you're trying to report. Um, it's it, This is actually pretty important. So uh, look at related drivers in your subsystem. Please do not make up your own error codes. Uh, we have enough error codes to cover all possible cases. The, the, the thing here that's important is that error nodes are part of the user API. Uh, so this is part of the covenant uh, or the promise between the kernel and user space. Uh, user space is expecting a, a certain number of errors for certain conditions and so even if it doesn't look right to you, if it doesn't seem like it's the right code, if that's what the subsystem is reporting, uh, then you should follow the follow those guidelines. So, so you don't want to break your user apps uh, by having your driver, <coughs> excuse me, having your driver report some weird error no. So, <coughs> so, excuse me, some of the popular error no's are um, in the, this table here, uh, eInval, uh, enomem, uh, you know, devs. And so the, you're going to find it's pretty easy to find out what is the appropriate error. Uh, sometimes there are debates, but uh, it usually comes down to you just don't break user space. Just make sure you return uh, what user space is expecting and can deal with. Um, and then return values for pointers. Uh, you use these three macros, error pointer in the, uh, the thing that's returning the pointer, and then is error and pointer error. Uh, these are all de defined in include Linux error. Uh, it's pretty easy to use if you have an error condition. Instead of returning uh, a null, if you need to give an error no back, uh, then you just return error pointer with uh, minus error no. Uh, and then the caller, who's the, the routine that's receiving the pointer, you should check uh, that the pointer is an error with is error. And then if you need to convert that back into an error no to whoever called you, you use pointer error. Uh, and then if you actually, you can also use pointer error if you need to use uh, that code in, an, in a print K. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So the general rule of thumb is you should always use is error before pointer error. You will find some exceptions. Uh, you can use pointer error without using error, is error if there's only one error no possible. So we don't want to, we don't want to build like a bunch of case statements where we're checking for, you know, e invalid or e no int, uh, you know, before it, it individually as nodes. You just use is error and then and then branch as you need to. So, but you do occasionally see this idiom where if you know there's only one possible value, people will just use pointer error and just compare with that one static value uh, without the additional check. Uh, the main thing to remember here with nulls is that just remember that null is not the only return value. Uh, if you get an error, you do have the capability uh, to um, return uh, some information, an error node that can be used upstream of your routine. Um, let's see, wrong. Uh, 
Okay, <clears throat> in terms of function pointers, so uh, I, I, uh, the kernel has its own brand of object-oriented programming, uh, and there is extensive use of function pointers uh, in the kernel in structures. So instead of using C++ virtual tables, the kernel uses structs with function pointers. Now, this comes in kind of two varieties. There are structs that have, um, there are structs that have a mixture of data and functions. So things like struct device driver has a bunch of data, but it also has seven function pointers just in the same structure. But then there's also, <coughs> excuse me, there's also some uh, structures that are just purely for holding function pointers. And then you use a, fun a pointer to them included in other structures. So the, the biggest one example of this is struct file operations. That has about 30 different function pointers depending on your kernel config. Um, and then, so the, here's an example of how you would use those. Uh, the definition of file operate, struct file operations is over in Linux uh, fs.h. Um, and you can see, you know, for, for something that uh, looks to the Linux kernel, like it can do file, looks like it's a file, it has lseek, read, write, read, iter, read, write, read, write, iter, and a whole bunch of other functions. But you don't have to use all of those. You don't have to declare all of those. And I'll talk about that in a second. So over in uh, drivers care RTC, uh, you can see how uh, you would declare an instance of file operation instructions, in this case called RTC FOPS, uh, and uh, you, you assign the, the variables, the actual functions in your code uh, that will, will be those pointers. And then inside uh, some other structure, in this case RTC dev, uh, you'll actually have a reference uh, to that instance of the file operations. So in this case, uh, RTC FOPS. Now, just a note here on, uh, uh, oh, let's see. Let's talk about assigning. So assigning, uh, the function pointers are assigned using a, a relatively new C stat tagged structure initialization. So that means you can, you can assign as many um, functions as you need out of the total list of functions. So in this case, I think Zillibus uh, defined maybe 10 or so of the routines for file operations. And the system usually knows how to deal with, um, with uh, un uninitialized uh, function pointers. What happens is because you're using C tag structure initialization, the compiler will default all unnamed structure elements uh, to zero or null. Uh, and so that handles it for you. And then the, the routines that, that call through these function pointers will check for null if that's appropriate or uh, whatever. So, so basically you have these object methods that are defined at compile time. One thing that's kind of interesting is you think with all these, these pointers flowing around that there's a lot of uh, dynamic coding and things, things getting changed at runtime. That's really not the case. Uh, it's fairly uncommon uh, for function pointers to be changed at runtime after initialization. So um, once they're set, usually that's, that's what they are. Uh, here's just some conventions for function pointer names. Uh, you, if you're going to define a new structure that has a bunch of function pointers, you should call it something underscore operations. And here's a bunch of ones that are already in there, SMP operations, TTY operations, seek operations for sequential file operations, and of course the big granddaddy file operations. These are This is the frequency of use, uh, 1600, 1600 times as file operations used in the kernel. And then the name for a declaration of the structure is uh, something something underscore ops or f ops or something like that. And the name for the pointer member uh, pointer, which is a member in another structure, is just the, the something ops. Uh, and then the function names themselves, the things that you assign into the structure, just the convention is uh, you have a prefix that which is like driver specific or subsystem specific, and then underscore, and then the operation name. And so if everybody follows these conventions, it helps to make it um, easier for people to follow the code. Uh, just the rationale for this, well, it's, some of this is obvious, but uh, function pointers allow for polymorphism. So the caller does not need to know the type of the object. So the file handling code in Linux doesn't need to know, uh, you know whether it's an RTC device or some other kind of device. Um, this is more straightforward and faster than virtual tables. Uh, there's less runtime overhead. Um, and uh, then if you look at it, really what operations that struct is essentially a hand managed virtual table. And so it's, uh, it's similar to virtual tables is just hand managed. Uh, this is transparent. It's fairly easy once you understand the mechanisms to see what's going on. 
The downside, of course, to function indirection is that you can't do uh, compiler optimization. You can't inline these functions, but you really can't do that with any kind of polymorphism anyway. So, um, so it's really, it's just the way it is. There's an excellent um, description of this stuff in, uh, by Neil Brown, Function Pointer Resources. Uh, just check out that article on lwbn.net. Um, okay, now moving on, I'd like to uh, talk about a macro that's used quite heavily in the kernel called container of. Uh, so container of is a macro that converts a pointer to a member of a structure to into a pointer to the containing structure. So uh, if you look at this example here, we have a hardware structure, clock hardware structure, and that is a structure that's embedded inside another structure. <clears throat> a struct clock divider, and you can use container of uh, to move backward from the internal object to the containing structure. And there's actually a macro defined to clock divider, uh, which uses the container of macro to, to perform that operation. Um, so here's the definition of container of. Uh, it's, it's a little bit dense in terms of uh, reading the code. Uh, it's about five. It's five lines long. The middle three are not not too critical. I'll, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this a little bit just to show you what's going on here. Uh, so the build bug on those middle three messages uh, that is to check that the pointer that has been passed in has the same type as the item in the structure it's supposed to be pointing to. So that's just that's a compile time check uh, that there's no overhead at runtime. And the interesting thing about that, if you if you want to look at it in detail is this just shows how to do type checking uh, with a macro. If you if you take that build bug on out, uh, then really the container of just boils down to these two lines. Uh, M pointer equals voice star pointer, and then um pointer uh, minus the offset of. So the first line there uh, is just the C casting for the to, to change things into a void for the pointer arithmetic that's going to happen on the next line. Uh, offset of generates a compile time constant. Uh, with the offset of the member item. And then the only operation that performed, which is kind of interesting, the only thing that happens at runtime is that minus. Uh, right there, that's the only, everything else you see uh, evaporates. This uh, container of uses no registers. Uh, it doesn't, uh, there's no conditionals actually executed in here. So it's really interesting to me that uh, these kernel macros that, you, that look really, really complicated, if you actually dig dig into them, you find that they have a way of evaporating into very, very efficient implementations. Um, so container of resources, here's, here's some links if you want to uh, read up on that. So the next thing I want to talk about is kind of a higher level concept, uh, abstract concept called embedded anchor. So an object is, uh, this is when an object is embedded into another one, and the access to the parent object is gained by using a pointer to the, the member. So this is used a, lo a lot of places in the kernel. Uh, it's often used with container data structures. So things like lists, hashes, and trees uh, use the embedded anchor kind of uh, uh, coding pattern. Uh, this allows objects to be in those containers. Instead of the container pointed to the object, the container points to the anchor inside the object. And you can have as many anchors as you want inside the object. It's, it's uncommon to have more than maybe three or four, but but you can have as many as you want. Uh, so there are examples of moving from the anchor to the object. Uh, some of the common examples are interface to USB dev, uh, K object to device, and then list entry, of course, is used all over the place. Um, so um, embedded anchor, the, the way this uh, design pattern works is you use container of to back up from the anchor to the object. It's used in all kinds of different collection types. So doubly linked lists, singly linked lists, red, black trees, hash tables. Um, and interesting to note that not that these uh, data collection types, they use the same anchor. So both hash tables and lists use struct hlist node. So you'll, it's, uh, there's some efficiency there in, in terms of the code that's used. So you might, you might think that uh, each of the collections has its own type, but they don't. Uh, this is the reverse of kind of how we normally think of uh, how collections operate. Normally, kind of if you are used to, you know, the standard programming, uh, you'd see a list struct that would have a separate node allocated that points to each object in the list. And so the, 
the object that's part of the collection is different from the object that's uh, being contained in the collection. With the Linux kernel, uh, that object structure is actually embedded. Uh, so the object structure that's being put on the container or in the in the list has the the collection node structure embedded in it as an anchor. <clears throat> However, this is also used for other things besides collections. So you see this for struct k object, struct dev, and many many more places. So it's a very good idiom to kind of uh, learn uh, how to use. Uh, so here's an embedded anchor diagram. This is a, an example of multiple anchors kind of embedded. You have a struct k object that's inside of a struct device uh, that's inside of a struct CXL, and you can move between the two using uh, appropriate macros. And here's an example of how you have a struct hlist node. You can have multiple objects that are on a, a list. Uh, in this case, this is just the standard doubly linked list. Uh, but one of the objects could uh, also be on another list. Um, and so <clears throat> you can see that the list code only has to refer to its structures. And uh, it doesn't have to know anything at all about the objects that are contained on the list. So some of the uh, the notes on this is that this allows for the data structure code to be independent of the node type. Um, it does not require a separate allocation for the data structure for the node. It's uh, your anchor is allocated along with the the parent object, and this also allows passing around the pointer to the anchor uh, if that's uh, easier and more appropriate instead of the object. and And this allows you to defer the referencing the object uh, until needed which can save some cycles. OK, so moving on, inlines. Uh, if you're thinking about writing a macro, well, uh, write an inline instead, <laughs> where possible. Uh, the reason is that inlines are, inlines are better because you get type checking of parameters, less side effects. OK, um, other than that, if you're not writing a macro, and I'll give you some other examples when it's appropriate, don't declare your functions as inline, OK? Uh, that is, don't use inlines on kind of your normal code. It's it's tempting to say, oh, I, I want this to run fast. I want it to be in context of my routine, so I'm going to make this inline. Uh, GCC will usually do a better job of you than figuring out inlines. It knows what architecture you're running on, number of registers. It's really easy for a, a developer to reason about the architecture they're writing the code for. Uh, not so easy to reason about all of the other architectures that the code might run on. So let the compiler do the work of inlining. Yes, I know that there are already over 80,000 inline declarations in the kernel and about 1,200 that use always inline. But uh, don't follow that example. Just don't don't declare your functions inline. So there, OK, so having said that, there are some guidelines for when you should do it. When you really know that the code you want to be that you want to declare as inline. So if, if something is supposed to boil down to a single instruction like compare exchange, OK, you can declare that as inline. Uh, also, for extremely short code sequences, if you know it's going to boil down to just a, a few short uh, lines of code, that'll uh, then that's OK. And then also for stubs that the compiler will optimize away. So you see a lot of function stubs that are in header if defs, and it's OK to declare those as inline. Um, so here's some here's some resources on that. Uh, now let's talk about macros. Having said that you should avoid macros at all costs, uh, I'm going to talk about them anyway. So uh, let's talk about one. If you're going to declare a macro, make sure you avoid side effects. This is kind of CS 101. Um, uh, so the problem with macros, of course, is that uh, whatever it's it's just a textual replacement. And so you can have weird side effects if you're not careful. The classic example is if you define max, uh, as I've shown here, then uh, if you if someone hands in n plus plus, uh, n may get uh, declared or incremented twice, uh, but only sometimes. So this is just a notorious uh, source of bugs. So the solution for this is don't use macros. Uh, use inline functions instead of macros. Um, use temp variables uh, in your macros if you have to do this. Uh, to avoid that particular side effect. Um, and find an existing kernel macro. The mac kernel's been around for uh, like what, coming up on 30 years now. Uh, you don't, there's probably a macro that already exists that will do what you need. Uh, here, just for fun, look at how easy it is to declare a side effect free uh, macro. This is, this is the definition for max in the Linux kernel. So what looks like a very, very simple operation, if you're gonna actually do type checking, and uh, handle you know 
reduce side effects. This is what it looks like. So avoid macros if you can. If you're going to do it, it's got to be at least this level of complexity to handle all the weird cases. Uh, the next <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk about is do while. You'll see this a lot in header files in the kernel. And this is, uh, this is how to structure macros, uh, particularly macros that do multiple operations uh, so that they can work in any context. Uh, the, the goal here is that all statements in the block are performed exactly once. Uh, the rationale is that multi-statement macros, uh, they, uh, under certain conditions, uh, if you're not careful, they'll act weird. So, for instance, that, that example I just had of perform food that did two operations. If, if you use it in this, uh, this first, well, let's see, you have, you can use it in do while loops or you can use it in if statements. The, the, problem child is this if statement that has no braces. So if you if you expand that macro perform foo uh, it, under that if some condition without braces, then it'll expand and unfortunately it'll cause that the only the first uh, only the first operation or statement of that macro will be performed, which of course will be very, very confusing. These are very hard bugs to find. So you see a lot of do while used in the kernel. Um, and if you have a macro that you, is going to expand to multiple, multiple statements, make sure you wrap it in a do while. The other macro that you'll see a lot of in the kernel is uh, likely unlikely. And these are used to indicate the probability of conditional uh, code uh, and for an if statement. So uh, these are used to, to annotate the code. Uh, they actually don't perform, uh, they don't perform any runtime function in the code, but they're used by the compiler. Uh, to structure the branches. The, the normal meaning is that the compiler will avoid a jump uh, in the case of the most likely branch of the conditional, and that helps avoid pipeline stalls. Uh, the general rule of thumb is you should not use these if uh, the lightning list uh, of the branch is affected by the workload. If the workload can make likely or unlikely the wrong thing, then, then don't do it. You should just let the CPU branch predictor handle those cases. Uh, there is a really weird thing. Uh, if you have super high performance, there's something in the kernel called static keys. I'll let you read up on that. Um, so likely and unlikely are often used in error, uh, Linux error paths. And uh, some developers actually recommend uh, against them, saying that, well, the CPU has branch predictors and it's going to do better than you. But not all CPUs have branch predictors. So I'm an embedded guy, and uh, especially low-end embedded, uh, sometimes uh, the processors don't have branch predictors. So if you can help out a low-end processor, shave some cycles off, uh, I think they're useful. The general guideline for when to use them is only if you are confident that the take and not take and ratio of the branch is greater than 10 to 1. So if, there, if it's 90% likely or more, then uh, that's OK. But you should note the developers are notoriously bad at estimating the ratios. If you, if in doubt, just leave it off and, and let the CPU deal with it. Um, so if defs, uh, don't put if defs in your C code. Just don't do it. Uh, it, it so if you, if you have to do conditional comp code, which you will have to do, I mean, and I mean compile time conditional code, Compile out entire functions instead of parts of functions, and then use conditional code to inline functions in the headers. So let me let me show you what this looks like. Um, this is the wrong way uh, to do conditional code depending on a, a kernel config variable in drivers USB hid core. So you can you have an if def here, which uh, that if def is only only applies if if that particular kernel config. Uh, is used. So that is the wrong way to do it, is to put the if def in the C code. Um, the right way to do it is to take the function that's being called by that conditional and put it up in, and put the if def up in the h file, right? So uh, you have hid dev.h, and you notice that uh, depending on config USB hid dev, you either got the, the reference, the external reference to the function, or you've got an empty function, a hid dev hid event. Notice over on the very far hand right, it's just an empty function. What will happen in the C code is that if that function disappears, hid dev hid event, the entire conditional will also disappear. So there's no, uh, there's no penalty performance cost, uh, for doing it that way. The, the rationale for this is that the C code 
uh, without if defs is much more readable. And because there's no performance penalty, uh, it's, it's, it's very useful to structure the code that way. Um, now, this may require refactoring your code. So you got to be careful that the refactoring cost doesn't exceed, you know, the maintainability improvement. Um, when, and one attribute of this or one aspect is that when you're debugging, you need to remember that there's a lot of code that is not actually there in the binary. Um, so, uh, you don't basically all the if there's if defs in there in the header files, but you're not seeing them. And so when you're function tracing or when you're debugging, you got to remember that a lot of the code uh, in Linux kind of evaporates. Um, and then there's a special macro for testing config variables. So you can actually structure it like uh, C code. It's called is enabled. Uh, and you can use this directly in, in your C code instead of some kind of if def. Um, and though, even though it's a macro, uh, and it's mostly done in pre-processing, uh, it, it looks like C code. So here's an example from USB HCD unmap herb set for DM, set up for DMA. That's a long routine. Um, so you can use that in C code and uh, notice that it's even, uh, done in conjunction with, uh, regular C code that, so, because of that and ampersand ampersand there, the, the, the second part of that if is going to evaporate away if, if the is enabled does. Um, so it's pretty tricky, but it's pretty nice. And then this is actually mentioned in a coding style guide in the kernel. Okay. Now on to print case. Uh, so the rule on print case, uh, don't add more print case to the kernel boot up sequence. Uh, yes, we know your initialization is important and you want to see what's going on, but the startup messages are already long enough. Uh, embedded Linux in particular wants to boot quickly. And uh, if everyone, if every single driver uh, populated tons of print case, uh, it would really slow down boot. So don't think about what users of your, your code want to see, because there are many, many more people who are not using your code who don't want to see your boot up messages. So it, it's perfectly fine to, to do debug level um, or, or to put them in temporarily, but don't, don't by default, uh, you should not be adding uh, print key messages to the startup boot, uh, boot messages. Uh, it's preferred instead of calling print K directly to use the, the PR underscore um, levels. So there are, uh, there are what, like eight uh, different, um, message levels in the kernel, and there's a print K wrapper for each one of them. Uh, well, actually, there's way more than that because there are subsystem specific print Ks, and you should use those if they're available because they'll print out additional information. So, like dev print K will print some additional device information, like the device name or something, uh, and automatically. And so, there's a whole bunch of these. The, in fact, there's a ton of them. So, don't go and nuts and make your own new print K wrappers. Uh, literally, there are hundreds, uh, there may be thousands of print K wrappers in the kernel. Here are some of the popular print K wrappers. And, and for each of these, uh, most of these also have their own like eight levels defined for, um, for the different uh, message levels. So there's, I'm sure there's a print K in the kernel that exists already that you can use. Uh, okay, last idiom is a switch statement fall through. So uh, there was work recently completed to analyze fall through for case blocks. Um, so it, there's a weird thing in uh, when you're doing case statements, sometimes uh, it's more efficient to structure your cases so that one case can fall through to the next one uh, and continue doing some operations. It's not super common, but it does happen. And uh, it's very hard to tell when that break is intentional or not, or the, or in this case, the missing break. Uh, so annotations were added, uh, throughout the kernel to make sure that all of the, all of the cases where fall through occurs are actually labeled in that process. Several bugs were fixed. Uh, and, uh, because we found out that the fall through is unintentional. It just was a missing break, uh, by mistake. So the, the good news is that now we can turn on a compiler optimization flag or not an optimization, a warning flag, GCC dash W implicit fall through. Uh, and because we've annotated all the places where we believe uh, that, that, is, that is the intended thing, uh, we can now catch un unintentional implicit fall throughs in new code. So now you can turn this uh, flag on, and if you happen to have missed a break by mistake, uh, you'll get a warning, and those warnings should be rare enough that it comes to the attention of people. So the bottom line is, if you do a fall through in a switch statement, if you're going to have a, a break case or a case without a break, uh, 
make sure you annotate it, annotate it. And you, you do that with a comment. Okay. So this is one of those weird cases where the compiler is actually looking at the comments in the code and actually, uh, knows something about what to hand, what to do with this. Uh, in this case, issue an, an error message. Um, and there, there's a resource for that. Okay. So I have gone through this stuff really, really quickly. And uh, I just want to point out some conclusions. So if you, uh, so if you look at these idioms, your kernel coding is really an exercise in balance. Uh, you're trying to take into consideration other developers who have to read through your code. Uh, and, and you have to take into account other developers who are, uh, are executing, uh, your code and, um, following these conventions is, is helpful, uh, for everybody in terms of maintainability. So when you're writing code, you're taking into consideration a balance between the correctness, the performance and the maintainabilities, maintainability. And it's important to keep in mind that maintainers are a scarce, uh, resource and they're overworked. And so, uh, we, we need to make sure we do stuff that, that makes it easier for them. Uh, so even if it requires a little bit of extra upfront cost for you to, to structure things properly, that it's better in the long run for the, the whole ecosystem. Uh, one thing about conventions um, and consistency, it's usually just best to do things the same way as everyone else. So it's easier mentally for the maintainer, if they're looking at a piece of code, if it looks the same as other people's code, it's easier for them to deal with. So if your code, if you look at your code and it's kind of different than the other drivers in your subsystem, uh, you should take a look at that and kind of figure out why. Um, so most of the idioms are really about performance and maintainability. I mean, you, you can't really capture correctness in the idiom, except that, you know, the maintainability helps with correctness. Uh, in terms of performance, you see a lot of these idioms are about shaving off, you know, like one or two instructions uh, uh, in the path of the kernel. And uh, these things add up. Uh, so the kernel is very fast and the goal is to keep it that way by using these types of idioms. There's lots of very, very advanced algorithms in the kernel, our read, copy, update, x-rays, the way the locking is done. So the uh, upstream is very, very conscious of uh, the impacts of all the code on cache, lock contention, uh, those types of things. So a lot of maintainability comes from this consistency. But, and this is the, this is the caveat, uh, the consistency is for your maintainer subsystem, Necess not necessarily across the eternal kernel. So if I've said something here that your maintainer disagrees with, uh, if your sub subsystem maintainer tells you to do things a certain way, just do it that way and uh, you're going to have a much easier time. So with that, uh, I would like to point out some resources that are available. Uh, in this area, there's a lot of stuff. When I when I started writing this talk, uh, I thought that all of these were unwritten, uh, thus the uh, abstract. But I found that some of them had been written about, and some of these are actually in the coding style guide. Um, and uh, there's a development model patterns uh, that's in actually in the kernel documentation. Uh, oh, let's see, no, that's on lwm.net. Uh, but that's in Linux device drivers. So some of these things are documented. Uh, I highly recommend that you go see, read this uh, excellent series of articles by Neil Brown talking about kernel design patterns. It will really help you kind of uh, get your mind in the right uh, mindset for doing kernel development. Uh, anyway, I hope that this uh, information is useful. And uh, if you have any questions, you can email me directly. I'm risking a lot by putting my direct email on there, but uh, you can find it in a Git tree anyway. Um, anyway. Uh, I'll go ahead. I have a couple of minutes left here. So, uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'll take a look at those now. So I see, uh, one of the questions is by uh, Nishanth Menon, uh, context of is error, uh, is error or null is not exactly pre prevalent. Any reasons? Um, I don't know. Uh, I didn't even know there was an is error or null. So maybe that's why it's not prevalent. <laughs> um, so, uh, so in terms of answering this stuff, uh, I don't know if I, I think, I guess I just answer online. Um, okay. Okay. So here's another question. How does error pointer overlap with actual valid addresses? on 32 architectures with four gig or more RAM. So the Erno uh, 
Airdos, I think, are limited to, in value to under 4K. Uh, there, there are less than 4,000 Airdos defined. And so if you look at what, what that means is if a pointer is treated as an unsigned, uh, that, then what you're going to do is you're going to chop off the top 4K uh, uh, addresses. So basically, you're losing the, the very, very topmost page of memory that you could possibly address by, uh, by, putting, by using Air Pointer. And so if you, if you combine the fact that you're not allowed to use addresses in the zero range and uh, error pointer makes it so you can't use the addresses in the top range, it's not a huge, I mean, considering you have 4 billion addresses, losing 8K is not too bad. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a question from Thomas Lowry. So have you found any of these idioms useful in code bases outside of the kernel? Uh, or are they really just unique to the design decisions and environment of the kernel? Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't, I don't see a lot of these used outside the kernel. I'm trying to think of which of these. I mean, you know, checking for null pointers and you know avoiding side effects on macros. But like the way that the kernel avoids side effects on macros is pretty complicated. And like the whole embedded anchor thing, that's quite different from what you see in other places. I, you know, I was taught in my early CS career to um, to always put your link pointer at, at address zero in your structure which I suppose is a form of it, but it's kind of a, a degenerate form of embedded anchor. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't, well, I don't do a lot of uh, C coding outside the kernel, so I may not be qualified to say, but uh, uh, from what I can tell, I don't see a lot of uh, use of these idioms outside the kernel. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, I can't pronounce that name, but someone has asked for, for NC. Last, I did performance work, which was about five years ago. I found with perf that GCC doesn't always get it right and needed a couple of inlines for performance tweak. So I would say uh, I, I think that's a fair comment, uh, basically that, you know, if uh, if you really do know better than the compiler, if you if you're uh, going to the trouble of uh, reading the assembly that's output by the by the compiler, and uh, determining that uh, it it should have inline when it when it didn't, I think it's fair to go ahead and add an inline. Um, always inline. There's also an always inline macro that says that forces the compiler. Uh, ordinarily, inline the inline attribute is just a hint. Uh, but you know, I'm not saying don't use your good judgment. Just recognize that um, what you're looking at on a particular CPU architecture. That might not apply to some other architecture, right? There, there are other CPUs that have less registers, or they use them differently, or, or you know, or you, even just the context of the call. You, someone may add a new caller to your routine, uh, and it just it does it's not appropriate for your code to be inline. So just be careful with it. Uh, but if you, I mean, if you know what you're doing, then that's fine. I, I you shouldn't be too dogmatic about it. And you can always just explain to people. Uh, does uh, Allison Chaikin ask, does dash w all include dash w implicit fall through? Um, I don't remember. I think they were planning on turning it on. So I think most of this work for the implicit fall through stuff happened in uh, five, six and five, seven. Maybe it was finished in five. Six, I don't know, but they were talking about actually turning it on. Uh, so adding it to the dash w all case um, so that it would be one of the generic default warnings that you got. Uh, so I think the goal is to have it be that way. I don't know if it, they've actually done that yet, though. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Allison Chicken asks, another, are there any GCC flags that we should use with the kernel that dash w all does not capture? For example, the fall through one. Wow, that is a big question. I, uh, uh, I, I don't know of any off the top of my head. I think I'm going to have to defer that question. Uh, there are probably some. I know that Frank Rowland has been working on, um, well, a lot of people have been working on tools to analyze the warning messages. And if we could get to a, a place where the warnings were silent, even when you had dash W all, that would be pretty nice. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, um, I have a question. Uh, Thanks a ton, Tim. You have referred to several blogs on LWN.net. What other blogs should we follow as a beginner? I think LWN.net is just the best resource. And there is a page, uh, I'm about to run out of time, so I hope I don't, but uh, 
there's a page called the kernel index. So make sure you go look at the kernel index. You can find a ton of information out there. Um, and I'm afraid my uh, time is uh, about running out here. So I want to say uh, thank you for the questions. I'll go over to Slack, and uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question here. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll see you over on the boards. Uh, bye.